This message comes from NPR sponsor Netflix with All the Light We Cannot See. This four-part limited series, based on the novel, is a breathtaking tale of hope, human connection, and resilience. All the Light We Cannot See, November 2nd, only on Netflix. I'm Brittany Luce. You're listening to It's Been a Minute from NPR. A warning to listeners, this segment includes mentions of abuse and suicide. Like many millennials in their mid-30s, I have so many fond memories of a little MTV show called Total Request Live. (laughs) After school, me and every other preteen in America would run up our parents' phone bills, calling in to request our favorite music videos by Destiny's Child, Blink-182, and of course, Miss Britney Spears. Britney was our teen queen. She was pretty, she was sweet, and she had the hits. For a brief moment in time, she was a girl, not yet a woman. But after custody battles, a public meltdown, and her restrictive 13-year conservatorship, Britney's girl-next-door image changed, and her story became shrouded in mystery. Until this week, when Britney released her first-ever memoir, The Woman in Me. Now, if you know me, you know I have been waiting on this book and I tore through it the day it came out. But I'm not the only one who was ready to hear Britney's truth. Someone today said, oh, is this like your Olympics? And we go, I don't know, do Olympics happen once in a lifetime? No, it's bigger than the Olympics. If you don't get a gold medal, you can try again in four years. But this is it for us. (laughs) That's Claire Parker and Ashley Hamilton. Comedians and co-hosts of Celebrity Memoir Book Club, a podcast that discusses a different celebrity memoir each week. And when Britney's book was announced, I knew I had to talk it through with the two of them. I mean, it went down like a glass of water. Oh, my God. (laughs) It was like uh, the pages turned themselves. Spread out with a lot of double spacing, a lot of like (laughs) paragraph breaks. If I hit this in as a high school essay, I think my teacher would say, Claire, you did not hit the word word minimum. (laughs) The duo has also covered the memoirs of Britney's mom and her sister. But before Celebrity Memoir Book Club, they had a podcast devoted to only Britney Spears. I've been saying that we did our undergrad in Britney Spears and we got our master's in celebrity memoirs. And in that way, this is our thesis. So if you were somehow unaware, Britney's book is kind of a big deal because outside of social media posts, it's the first time we've really heard from Britney in years. Now that Britney's free of the conservatorship and back in control of her own life, she's finally telling her story in her own words. Claire, Ashley, welcome to It's Been a Minute. It's so great to have you. Thank you so much for having us. We're so excited. Thank you. To start off, before we get into Britney's own memoir, I wonder what is your favorite Britney Spears fact that the average person might not know? One of the things we love about Britney Spears is that she actually came up with a lot of her most iconic moments herself. The fact that she shot Baby One More Time at a school because she was like, they wanted it to be space themed. And she was like, but I think it relates more to me and my peers if we're just, the bell rings and we just start dancing. That was her vision. And then she wanted to wear school uniforms. I mean, she created that with her own perfect mind. (laughs) Her own mind as a teen. Yeah. You know, one of the earliest big admissions in the book was that Britney's dad, Jamie Spears, was a semi-absent alcoholic. And his addiction and temperament seemed to rule their family. And as I read the book, one thing that came up for me is that I think Britney's family dynamics would have been the exact same, even if Britney had never become famous. Did you all see that? Or is that just like a thought that I'm having? No, I completely agree. I mean, I don't think that fame or anything changes people. I think it heightens the extremes and the possibilities. Mm. Something that's interesting to me, because we read Jamie Lynn's book and we read Lynn Spears' book. So in Lynn Spears' book, it's not hidden. I mean, the whole town knew Lynn admits it. He was an alcoholic. He struggled. They broke up multiple times. So they are very tumultuous on and off. Something that I Mm -hmm. found interesting was Mariah Carey in her memoir talks a lot about being the baby sister of parents who have a very tumultuous dynamic. 
But because she was the baby, she was often spared the physical abuse and seeing her father at his worst, which allowed her to yes. keep him as a hero in her eyes. And something Brittany talks yes. about with Jamie Lynn is because Jamie Lynn was not around when they were very poor. She was not around when his mm -hmm. drinking was at its worst. Jamie Lynn has a different idea of her own father than Brittany. And in Jamie Lynn's book, you see that she went through a lot. I mean, she was a woman who was also forced to, into an abortion. She resisted and said, no, I want to have this baby. But they said, if you're going to have this baby, we need to take you into mm -hmm. hiding. You can't speak to anybody. She was isolated in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Jamie Lynn's book is a very difficult read because she'll sit there and say, like, I had all of these things taken out of my control, but Brittany should just behave and deal with the control. Like, it, it really is tough to look at hmm. those paragraphs back to back. Mm, that is so true. I mean, that was something that Brittany had said in the memoir. She said that, like, when she was looking to Jamie Lynn for support, that Jamie Lynn would text her something to the tune of, like, just put your head down, just deal with it. It's sad to see how there's, like, this essential sort of family chaos that everybody seems to say is there that really deeply affected everyone in the family. I mean, what's definitely true on both accounts is this idea that the business, the family business, which is pushing young women into stardom comes before the young women themselves. Yeah, I mean, the book lays out Jamie Spears, her father's alcoholism and how his instability established mm -hmm. that reliance on Britney from an early age. Like when she was small, the family had no money. And then her dad opened this gym and the gym made a lot of money. And then, you know, through his drinking and instability, they lost it. And it seemed that pretty quickly the family pivoted to profiting off of Britney. That's one of our big tenets is if your seven-year-old is desperate to sing and dance and act, put them in community theater. I'm sure there's an after school activity <laughs> that they could engage in. <laughs> I mean, I truly think there's like nothing more horrifying you can do for your child than to like put them in the entertainment industry. There's like a couple different levels of child star memoirs that we've read where for the most part, they are not willing to admit that their parents forced them. For the most part, they all are so tied to this narrative of I asked, I wanted it so bad and my parents made it happen for me. I think it's really difficult for like a child star whose like life was ruined by being in the spotlight to turn around and be like, oh my God, I actually didn't want that. Thinking more about the Spears family dynamics, like some of these dynamics go back beyond, yes. you know, Jamie and Lynn Spears. They go back to Jamie Spears' father, to Britney's grandfather. I want to give Britney so much credit too. I thought Britney did such a beautiful job of giving just enough context to show her compassion and empathy for her own father, but it mm. did foreshadow a lot. The patterns of every time a woman acts up, you throw her in a mental hospital and give her some lithium. I could not believe that was in his own immediate past. I know. I mean, that was the thing that really blew my mind. I mean, in a way... June Spears provided something of a template for institutionalizing women when they stepped out of line or when they were in crisis or needed help. So June sent his first wife, Jean Spears, Britney's grandmother, to an asylum where she was put on lithium, as you said, after she was struggling, presumably grieving, from the death of, her, of their three-day-old son. She later shot herself on the grave of that three-day-old son. But June remarried another woman who, I, I, for some reason, was also institutionalized. It is really scary to see that, that that pattern, even down to the lithium detail. Lithium was a drug that when Britney was institutionalized in her 30s, that was a drug that she was placed on. It's really scary to see that as a pattern in their family. I mean, it's just like horrifying that this is the family business to say like, any woman who like isn't serving the larger goal, we'll just see what we have to do until she does. Mm, yeah. So we talked about some of the bombshells in this story, but something that I w was really caught off guard by, I guess I shouldn't have been because Brittany's kind of like a folksy gal, but how relatable this book was. I don't mean just in her tone because we all know Brittany is a Frappuccino drinking as you said, flip flop wearing. She's a regular girl. She's a she's a target girly. She's oh my gosh. She will wear an espadrille with any item you throw at her. <laughs> we like to say she's the only celebrity to ever genuinely wear her candies for Kohl's line. She's out there in khaki shorts 
and a peasant blouse <laughs> with her flip flops, messy bun hair, extension tracks for all to see. <laughs> Showing for all to see. So she's a woman of the people. But in comparison to other celebrity memoirs that I've read, I noticed that Brittany has very few details in the book that, that are any sort of wealth identifying details. Unless it's a detail she couldn't get around, like, I went to Italy to go spend time with you know Donatella Versace. You can't really get around that in telling that story. Were there moments that stood out as relatable to you? First of all, I don't know that she identifies as wealthy. I think she like just found out she's like a hundred millionaire recently. A line that got me is when she marries that man for 55 hours and she's talking about going home to Louisiana. She was in the guest house out on her mom's property and it was New Year's Eve and they were being too loud and her mom kept shushing her and she goes, and then I realized I have enough money that I could just take us to Las Vegas. And it really does (laughs) startle her in this way that you just go, oh, She is the most adorable person in the world. She's somebody who, if she could have, would have been partying at her mom's house. (laughs) And she goes, oh my God, I could pay for us to go to Vegas. And one time we did a timeline of how much music she put out, how many TV shows she was in, how many appearances she was doing. And when you look at her life, there's not a lot of time to sit back and enjoy enjoy the winnings. And I, I wonder if she was so young when it happened and she was so focused on buying these houses for her family and staying in touch with her friends... And I think because of that, she is just a humble person. Another huge, very relatable theme for me throughout the book that you might feel too is is that moment we were in, in the early aughts around the intense focus on body image. I'm sure it broke my brain in places it will never heal again, but like, For Britney Spears, that was inescapable. Like it was exacting and inescapable. What was it like for you to revisit that cultural phenomenon through Britney's eyes, Ashley? Someone actually sent me a reel today. I have to send it to you. It is like harrowing. It's just a super cut of celebrities on talk shows where their weight is a conversation. Posh Spice is doing an interview and like the TV presenter gets out a scale. And insists she weigh herself. Uh, is your weight back to normal? Yeah, it is. Can I check? Do you yeah. mind? Oh, no, you oh, did this to on. Jerry, didn't you? Come on. No, but Jerry was like really small. It's so what? shocking. It's so horrifying. And in Britney's book, she has this line where she talks about her body and the way her body's been scrutinized and that give me more performance. And she's like, I had mm. just had two kids in two years. I didn't have my abs back yet. Should I go to jail? I think that's the theme that comes out through the whole book. It's everything she did. She's like, okay, I went dancing with my friends. I should go to jail. I shaved my head. I have to go to jail. She wasn't just judged. She was ripped apart and seen as a bad person who was committing crimes almost against society. I mean, Brittany even writes in her book, she says, like, why can a rock star do heroin and throw a TV at a hotel window and I can't wear a cute dress and go party with my friends. She's like, I was drinking and like sometimes taking Adderall. Coming up, we all knew everything about the star and watched her every move. But how did millions of people miss the abuse? This message comes from NPR sponsor, Discover. Like using debit over credit? Think it's time to also get rewarded? Well, now you can with Discover Cashback Debit. It's a checking account that rewards everyone with cash back on everyday purchases, plus all the things you've been contemplating. So that concert, no brainer. Self-care, yes, please. Do what you love and get cash back while you're doing it. Check out eligibility and terms at discover.com slash cashbackdebit. Discover Bank, member FDIC. This message comes from NPR sponsor Netflix, presenting All the Light We Cannot See. Directed by Sean Levy and starring Hugh Laurie and Mark Ruffalo, this four-part limited series, based on the Pulitzer Prize-winning novel, is a breathtaking tale of hope, human connection, and resilience. It follows Marie Lore and Werner's journey through World War II, where their paths collide in the pursuit of light amidst darkness. Watch All the Light We Cannot See, November 2nd, only on Netflix. What's good, y'all? I'm Gene Demby from NPR's Code Switch Podcast, and I'm one of thousands of NPR network voices coming to you from over 200 local newsrooms across the country. We bring people from all over closer together through free and independent journalism. The NPR Network. What you hear changes everything. Learn more at npr.org network. 
I want to talk about the conservatorship. Like it made huge headlines a few years ago, and I'm sure you remember the documentaries. And I want to say it's really notable. The conservatorship looms large in this book. It takes up around half the book. And we get a lot of details about the horrors of her conservatorship. Her family put her on tour when she didn't want to be on tour. But even when she was on tour, at one point, she couldn't even leave her hotel room unless she had given her security team two hours notice just to leave her hotel room. I wonder what moments of the conservatorship that Brittany shared in the book stood out to you? The way that her fame took off so fast. When you think about the timeline, it is shocking. It was 99, 2000, and 2001 were her first three albums. 2002, no album came out, but there was a world tour. 2003, I believe she had another album out. I think 2004 is when she married K-Fed. 2005 and six, she had children. 2007 was when she shaved her head. And then by 2008 is when they locked her up in a way where they were still pushing her out to do things. And I think that this book sold like a bazillion copies before it even came out. And I do think one of the reasons for that was people saying, how are we watching this? And we didn't see it happen. I think like millions of people have that question of like one of the most famous women in the world. How did this happen? That's part of my curiosity was like, how was all this happening with this woman who had been so overexposed, right? I know so many of the minutia of her life. I know her old dog's name was Bit Bit. Like I know so many things about Britney Spears. And yet for this woman who was so overexposed, there are so many things that we didn't see happening kind of in front of us. But you know, I mean, Britney Spears memoir, it's that's like a memoir of a certain kind that I feel like we've seen a lot of over the last few years. Memoir or documentary, like Paris Hilton, Pamela Anderson, Janet Jackson, Jessica Simpson. You see in those women's stories how they were affected by misogyny in the media and in their respective industries. But you can also see in their stories how their bad childhoods or abusive husbands or broken families shaped their lives. But Britney's story feels really unique to me in that for her the structural harm of misogyny and also the personal harm of her family and her romantic relationships, particularly with Justin Timberlake and Kevin Federline, worked together in the form of her conservatorship and her custody agreement with Kevin Federline. Like she says that she felt disempowered by the state of California or how much power her family had over her from reading her text messages, determining what she could eat bugging her home, controlling her access to her money. Britney's story feels unique to me in that way because it feels like the most extreme personal and most extreme structural circumstances coming together in one place. Yeah, I think we look at, say, a Jessica Simpson, which would be quite comparable in that she is another woman who was deeply maligned by the media in the early 2000s. Of course, like a Britney Spears contemporary. I think she used her book to really wipe the slate clean, explain her perspective so that you empathize and sympathize with her and we're like, oh, we did do you dirty. And then it also set her up to have this next phase in life. And in that way, it did almost feel more than just a personal memoir. It felt like a business move. I think, you know, we think about memoirs and you think end of life. I think Mm. there's like an end of stage. And now it's like Jessica Simpson's writing this book as she enters the stage where she is a mogul. Britney Spears is so unique in that it wasn't just the misogyny of the media. It was literally the state. And it was also her parents. She talks about going on a talk show and talking about her conservatorship in order to get out of it and trying to like put put the rumors out there that she needed help and having it get cut out. So, I mean, the level of silence, I think, for a celebrity that, as you said, is so overexposed is pretty unique. We've never read a book by somebody who is quite literally not allowed to tell their story. I mean, we've read memoirs from people who wrote it in jail. And even they got to tell their story Mm. in the written word. Only Britney was completely cut off from society in this weird, like, behind-the-glass windows way. You know, I think it becomes, like, a metaphor for any time somebody is oppressed by a system, every attempt they make to break through that oppression becomes evidence that they need to be, like, controlled further. And I think that that's what you see with Britney is every time she tries to break out of it, they had a way of saying, see, she doesn't go along easily. And that's why she needs to be controlled further. You know, the famous time that she refused to announce her new residency, that's her acting crazy. That's her needing to be drugged into submission because look, 
she's so ill that she won't go along with our hundred million dollar scheme that she is the basis of. Right. She's supposed to like go on stage and announce to Mario Lopez yeah. that she was going to go on tour and, and do a performance. And instead of doing that, she just like walked up on stage and kept walking and got right into the car. I remember that. I remember thinking like, oh no, girl, what's going on? Now I yeah. know. It was, she didn't feel comfortable saying no to her family. So she just kept walking right off that stage because she didn't want to openly publicly agree to something that she didn't want to do. We talked about like the courts, the state of California. We talked about her family. How does this book make you think about how we, the public, are implicated or were implicated in Britney's suffering. I do think that it was very careful not to ever blame you, the reader of this book, huh. who is probably also you, the reader of PerezHilton.com, mm. you, the reader of TMZ. And I do wonder if there's so many people immediately to blame that she doesn't even need to go as far as to hate everybody in the world who did participate in this. And so I will say the book doesn't condemn us, but I think we all need to take a good hard look at ourselves and say, what other conclusions are we drawing about women? We lived through the Amber Heard, Johnny Depp trial at the same time that we were looking back and saying, we were so mean to Britney Spears. And I don't know. It's, I do think we need to be stricter with ourselves and show more discipline in our media consumption. Yeah, I do agree that we can show more discipline in our media consumption. I believe we're armed with more information to not repeat those same mistakes. And so it makes it harder to watch people do it again and again and again and again. Because I feel like there have been four or five since we said, wait, we were really mean to Brittany. Mm, mm -hmm. Do you feel like you have more insight into Brittany as a person after reading this book? I feel that it really showed me that who the person you're seeing in those interviews is who she is. I think she says it a couple of times throughout her book that she's naive. She's made mistakes. I think she is somebody who is just like an innocent person who wants to be loved and loved. I do feel like the way she writes does line up with who we've felt she is, which is a girl in flip flops who just kind of wishes she owned a dance studio in Louisiana. <laughs> And I don't know, that does kind of feel like what I read. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Ashley, Claire, this has been such a joy. I mean, I can't think of anybody I'd rather talk about Britney Spears with than the two of you. This is so great. Oh, my God. It was so good. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. That was Ashley Hamilton and Claire Parker, comedians and co-hosts of Celebrity Memoir Book Club. Hey, Brittany. Hey, Brittany. Hey, Brittany. Hey, Brittany. It's Bria from Oakland. All down my timeline, I'm seeing people debating about where is or isn't an appropriate spot for a first date. Do you have any advice on how to have a successful first date? Thanks so much. Bria, thank you so much for calling. I love this question. Dating. It is never easy. You're trying to meet a stranger or relative stranger and feel each other out, it's a lot to contend with. And so I see how people have gotten to this place. I'm of the opinion that a first date is just the time to get to know another person. You shouldn't have to put so much pressure on yourself to think about what is this about to be? Where is this going? It's really just like, am I attracted to this person? Am I enjoying myself? That's really what a first date is. Yes, that could happen over a $500 dinner with six courses, you know, at one of those beautiful white tablecloth restaurants where people refill your water before you've had the chance to even swallow the last sip. You could do that, but you could also go to a putt-putt place. What I'm saying is I don't have too many rules for first dates other than ask questions, be forthright and answer questions, try to be polite and have a good time. Don't be cheap, but also don't go on the date and order a bronzino at a burger restaurant. Don't do things that don't make no sense. Maybe don't wear sweatpants to meet somebody for the first time. Show them that you were excited to see them and that maybe you wanted to put some effort into your look. But beyond that, just be safe, enjoy yourself and have fun. Bria, thank you so much for calling with this question. If there's anything I love is for people to ask me dating advice. <laughs> Anyway, I hope you have a great weekend. And maybe next time somebody asks you out on an ice cream date, 
maybe just try it out see what happens. Thank you again, Bria. I really enjoyed answering this question. This episode of It's Been a Minute was produced by Barton Girdwood, Alexis Williams, Liam McBain, Corey Antonio Rose. Our editor is Jessica Plachek. Engineering support came from Stacy Abbott, Phil Edfors, Trey Watson. Our executive producer is Verilyn Williams. Our VP of programming is Yolanda Sanguini. Our senior VP of programming is Anya Grundman. All right, that's our show for today. I'm Brittany Luce. See you next week for another episode of It's Been a Minute from NPR. Hey, it's Marielle Segarra from NPR's Life Kit podcast. I'm one of thousands of NPR network voices coming to you from over 200 local newsrooms across the country. We bring all Americans closer together through free and independent journalism on music, politics, culture, and so much more. The NPR Network. What you hear changes everything. Learn more at npr.org slash network. Hey there, it's Aaron Scott from Shortwave, NPR's daily science podcast. I'm one of thousands of NPR network voices coming to you from over 200 local newsrooms across the country. We bring all Americans closer together through free and independent journalism, music, politics, culture, science, and so much more. The NPR network. What you hear changes everything. Learn more at npr.org slash network. The world of podcasts can feel overwhelming. We'll let you in on the easiest way to find your next favorite show. Head to npr.org slash podcast. From politics to pop culture to music and everything in between, you'll find a selection of shows that'll make you a super fan in no time. 